Um, now I have the privileges uh, of introducing uh, another revolutionary uh, individual, Dr. Naftali Kaminsky. Um, and in case you didn't notice, you're being photographed from afar. He's actually tweeting on stage. Um, he has many skills. Uh, but he is the uh, Baron Gott Ingelheim uh, uh, Professor of Medicine, Section Chief, Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at uh, University, or excuse me, Yale University. And um, uh, we are quite privileged to have him here today. So that's my uh, mandatory selfie with the audience. Please smile. I'm sending it to my mother. So uh, uh, it's really exciting to be here. Um, I couldn't help but reflect, Christine has mentioned it, 2011, the first PFF summit. I think Don Rose organized it. We didn't know that anybody would show up. And now they have this amazing room, you know, researchers, patients, advocates, philanthropy, industry. This vision, this success of PFF, Three Lakes uh, Partners and all, really is both evidence of past success, but really is promising transformation for the future. So I'll speak today about uh, uh, what we've learned from the IPF cell atlas. I'm going to warn you, enjoy the images. If you don't understand many of the things that I say, that's OK. I'm not sure I do, but they're really exciting. And I'll mention something about precision medicine and then give you the insights and what are the implications. So one thing is I want you, you to look at this slide. If you have a phone, take a photo. This is the dramatic increase in publications about IPF in the last um, 17 years. If you look at it, every, we normalized it to every other field. You know, cancer drives the publication rate, and, and cancer publications have almost doubled in the last 17 years. But there has been a 700% increase in publications for myoparbosis. And this is not just publications about our lives and our stories. This is science that is so, going to drive cures and medications. So I won't go into this uh, introduction about pulmonary fibrosis, but I want to say something. In the previous talks, I focused about precision medicine, about an approach that really aims to move from one side fits all therapies to multi-level patient stratification. And the biggest focus is on the genetics and on the genetic diversity. But the thing that I want to convince you today is that actually there's an important genetic diversity that is overlooked. And this is the cellular diversity. Because when we're thinking about pulmonary fibrosis, and this is a pathological image of what happens in pulmonary fibrosis. And this is the model we have, uh, recurring microinjuries causing epithelial cell death, epithelial and fibroblast activation, remodeling of the matrix cell proliferation. We actually, when we use these words, we actually don't know what is exactly every cell that has changed there. But there's many cells. And fibrosis is the disease of an organ, unlike other diseases. And an organ is a highly organized multicellular structure of our body that is self-contained, has a specific vital function, and is really built of cells. What you're seeing, this beautiful image in, in the bed is actually a lung, and you see the breathing motion, and you see the green is actually these cells. There's many of them. They're different. And fibrosis is actually a permanent disruption of the normal structure of the organ, characterized by accumulation of extracellular matrix, stromal cells, leading to loss of function. So what we need to do to slow down fibrosis, you may affect one pathway. To cure it, you need to reprogram the organ. And to need to understand the cellular uh, changes, you need to uh, understand changes in resident and infiltrating cells, emergent, novel, and ectopic cell types, altered cell type communication. And the cool thing is that we have the technology now to do it. So the IPF Cell Atlas is a multi-center grassroots emergent effort aiming to create a comprehensive map of all human cells in pulmonary fibrosis and other fibrosis interstitial lung disease. This beautiful image that you're seeing rotating is actually a real image of 300,000 cells in the human lung. This is a way that we depict it, so we can actually look at the data. And the different colors are the different cell types. There's been so far uh, uh, several offers and multiple papers, so four 
or five groups have published. But I want to highlight one thing. Again, take out your phone, scan this QR code, and you have access to the data. And this is big because today, we, we posted this a week ago, and this is with the support of Three Lakes uh, uh, partners. We posted it a week ago, but we put all the data publicly from these four data sets. So you, if you have a gene you like, you can actually search it. And this is unique because this is before publication. And we believe that this is going to be transformative. So what did we find? A lot of stuff. This is really cool. So one is, and again, these images you don't have to really understand, but when you were, the data is surprisingly reproducible. People say about genomics, you cannot reproduce the data. Here are data from three or four data sets, and they found the same thing. They highlighted a the specific cell type, profibrotic macrophage. And what is interesting is one of that we find it in multiple things, but we can actually take this macrophage, and what you're seeing here is a heat map that basically classifying the macrophages based on their, I cannot really pronounce it, fibrosisness. This is like a, my Hebrew taking pill. But, but when we classify them, we can see where they start changing, and maybe we can identify a way to reverse this process. But here's the problem. When you look at these macrophages, Actually, the markers that we call for fibrosis actually are different, and every molecule is not overlapping. And what you're seeing below is that, and you could see it, you see you have yellow, green, red. These are different markers. Different cells express different markers. So again, we start to start thinking about this when we design interventions. The other thing that we found is that there's a huge change in inflammatory cells in the lung. And there's a, uh, a down-regulation of uh, uh, T cells and other cells. There's basically a shift in the inflammatory cell movement. And the same thing with epithelial cells. The most important cell in the lung, the cell the lungs exist for, is a type 1 epithelial cell. That's the cell that does gas exchange. This cell goes dramatically down in IPF. So although our focus has been on fibroblasts, to actually improve the lungs, we need to make find a way to increase the number of these cells. We also found a new cell type. And this is almost like the cancer cell of IPF. And we found it in three different data sets, our own and another one. This is these weird, weird cells. We call it aberrant basaloid cells because we're not really smart at finding good names. And they're basically the cells that you find at the edge. This is, again, what you see is the... Uh, um, the edge of the fibrotic lung, and these cells sit at the edge of the myofibroblast foci. And what is interesting about these cells is, for people like me who have been doing fi pulmonary fibrosis for 20 years, these is like the pulmonary fibrosis cells. They express epithelial markers, they express progenitor markers, they express mesenchymal markers, they can activate TGF-beta, they can do a lot of bad things. But they are early progenitor cells who carry actually programs to build the lung, suggesting that what we're seeing in pulmonary fibrosis is basically this deranged lung repair. We also found a novel uh, uh, type of blood cells and uh, uh, blood vessel cells in the lung, suggesting again that this, this ab abnormalization or what I call proximalization of the distal lung. And we found that pulmonary fibrosis, all of you have heard about fibroblasts, but what we really found is the distinction that we were not aware before we looked at this data. And what it is is people speak about fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, and they speak about fibroblasts becoming myofibroblasts. I'm going to say something that may hurt my career, although at this late stage, you know, only myself can hurt my career, is we don't really think so. We actually think that in the IPF lung, there's two types of bad cells, bad fibroblasts, invasive fibroblasts, and bad myofibroblasts. And the reason we look at this is, again, computational. We look at the fibroblast cells in the lung, and we identify two groupings of cells. One is a fibroblast, and one is a myofibroblast. And you see in the middle, there's sort of the, I don't know what you call it, the body of the butterfly. That's the connection. But they're not connection. One is fibroblast, one is myofibroblast. But each one of them has, bo has both fibrosis and not. So each one of them is good or bad. So we can take the edge of fibrosis and the edge of no fibrosis, and we can calculate the distance. And we can say, how is a cell going from being 
a good fibroblast to a bad fibroblast. So we could say how a myofibroblast, a normal myofibroblast, becomes a, my, a bad myofibroblast. And we can actually identify the molecules that drive this change. And what it suggests, is there is a continuous fibrosis-related trajectory within fibroblasts or myofibroblasts, but not across them. This is really important because all of our therapies are targeting these cells as one family. But actually, the molecules are different, the pathways are different. And sort of my last, you know, the previous talk spoke about telomere shortening in IPF, so is there evidence for global accelerated aging in pulmonary fibrosis? So the answer is actually not really. So we use epigenetic markers as a way to measure your aging clock in your life. And when we look at that, the lung in IPF is not older than your age. What we see is there's another marker for DNA image, damage and bad things that happen to you. That's where the lung has a lot of evidence of DNA damage. When we look at markers of aging, they show up mostly in these aberrant basalate cells, not in other cells. So again, it's not universal. And this is a cause for help because it means that if we eliminate these cells, maybe we're good. Maybe there is really hope for cure. We look at classic markers of inflammation, and they are all actually decreased. We find them in the aged lung, but we do not find them. Actually, uh, IL-1 beta is decreased in IPF lungs. IL-6 is decreased in IPF lung. That means that's why immunosuppression is probably bad for you. That's why if you try to inhibit inflammation, you're probably going to cause trouble. Is the data real? I believe so, otherwise I wouldn't present it. But we applied a variety of approach, and I won't go into detail. And yes, we think, you know, four cohorts, the same results. We were able to find these cells in other data sets, and really, believe me, yeah, the data is probably, probably real. So the last thing is sort of implication for therapy. I'm not getting a click. Could you get me the next slide? Just, it's not coming here. Oh, good. So basically, we applied some very fancy, again, uh, there is a delay here. Maybe it's my present. We applied very fancy method to look at cell networks. And we found that the, the lung in IPF is very different from normal. But, OK, now it's gone completely crazy. Yeah. OK. So here's the thing. So we have different networks, and these bad cell types are causing different changes. But when we looked at the drugs that are supposed to normalize an airway basaloid cell or a fibroblast, they're actually different classes. So again, we will need to actually follow the cancer uh, people and potentially give combination therapies, maybe do inductions like the old days, because we need to change these networks. So and last sort of what did we really learn? So here's the thing. This is the normal lung, and you see this beautiful structure. And what happens is basically with injury and uh, genetic predisposition, you start having this sort of type 1 cell death, type 2 proliferation, potential senescence, formation of ER stress, and, and release of dumps. Then you get activation of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. You get then activation of these developmental programs that cause stem cells that set in the airways to go into the lung, and then you get the mess. So we will need to stop this crazy repair program to really reverse the disease. So the data, again, what did we learn? Data is amazingly reproducible. The IPF lung cellular repertoire is dramatically changed. There's a shift in immune populations. There's the proximalization of the distal lung, disease-relevant population of invasive fibroblasts, and dysregulation of lung homeostatic circuitry. But in my last slide, I want to show you another lesson. So I don't know if you can see this, but these are emails between my group and Nick Banovich and John Kropsky and Vanderbilt. And in these emails, we actually coordinated the submissions of our papers and the posting on bio archives and, of course, tweeting. We actually tweeted at exactly the same minute. And what I learned from this was an interesting thing, uh, and the same thing, and we post all data sets on the uh, IPF Saltas. What we learned from this is what we should do is coordinate and collaborate and not comp compete, because we're really better together. 
And especially in an area like this, because when I speak with an editor of an important journal, again, they know about cancer, they know about diabetes, pulmonary fibrosis, mm. But if we go with multiple papers as a group, with patient organizations, with philanthropy, they will notice us. So again, we are better together. And I stop, this is actually, I finish every talk that I give the same thing with the dedication to our IPF patients. You know, hashtag PF warriors, hashtag, now we have a new hashtag, which is fight PF. I need to up update my slide. Thanking the uh, funding, the photos you see are these, all of these amazing people that created re resources. And again, I thank all of them. I thank you for your attention. And I really, really thank this is an opportunity for the patients and the family in the room, for your willingness to participate in research. Every single image I showed was generated from a sample of a patient. So really thank you. We're committed to make significant progress in this disease. Thank you.